So, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Banna. I'm an educational and child psychologist, um, and I'm also a lecturer in educational psychology here at Birkbeck. Um, I'm really glad to give the talk today on the Birkbeck Inspire series uh, on schoolwork and how we can make it effective and fun. Uh, I know this is a question that a lot of parents have uh, given circumstances and all the time that uh, you've been spending with children at home. Um, and before we start the session, I just wanted to take a moment um, and I wanted everyone to reflect on what you've achieved up to now. You've been in an unprecedented time and um, your children have learned so much and it doesn't have to just be schoolwork. It could be the laundry, it could be making breakfast, it could be making their bed, it could be setting up your Zoom conference. So I just want you all to take a moment and pat yourself on the back because you've done a good job. Um, so before really getting into the, the crux of um, a few strategies that we can use to make schoolwork effective, I wanted to just talk about preparedness for engaging with schoolwork, even at home. So at school, we, we look at the environment and we look at the mindset and we, ha we help children be more ready to learn. And this is something that you could rep at home. So first of all, thinking about a child's mindset, if we think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, if the child is anxious or isn't really feeling safe, uh, which in the current situation, there are a lot of anxieties um, happening around us. Um, but also, it's, it's one of the things that if a child doesn't feel safe, it's really hard to then ask them to concentrate and do that deep learning required for the schoolwork. So really taking a moment to deprioritize academic work if there is some anxiety going on and talking that through first. Other things to just keep in mind and think about is the physical environment. So having an appropriate environment, that could be a different space for schoolwork, but it could also be the same space, but modified for schoolwork. So you could have a box with all of the school books, um, and when the box is on the, the dinner table and all of these objects are on the dinner table, we're doing schoolwork, take those off, um, we've stopped. So really be clear about when it's time to do the work to help uh, your children be in that mind frame. So thinking about supporting them to develop those behaviours for learning. So really co-constructing a, a schedule, making that visual um, and really scheduling what time uh, is going to be dedicated for work, what is going to be the social time, scheduling time for exercise, time for healthy eating, snacks, but also breaks. So being realistic because you're not going to be asked to um, reproduce the same timetable as school has, um, but really just thinking about what's realistic and what works for you as a family without putting too much pressure on the academic side. Um, so what I'm going to do now is talk you through three uh, main strategies that, um, that I've, I've collated uh, just looking at the research is vast uh, and thinking of what are three things that you can do to really make the learning effective and fun at home. So the first one is reading for pleasure. The second one is supporting and engaging. And the third one is problem based learning. So reading for pleasure. We know that reading is one of the most important things and a very important indicator for um, life outcomes because it impacts on everything. But what's really important is a research uh, completed uh, by Sullivan Brown for the Institute of Education, uh, which was longitudinal over many years, showing that reading for pleasure has a significant positive impact for mathematical skills, vocabulary and spelling. And this was above and beyond um, any effects of the educational level of parents. So that pleasure for reading actually makes a difference for children. So go home. Uh, when you're at home, ask children to read whatever it is that they like. Do they want to read the Harry Potter books? Do they want the Lord of the Rings? Um, what is it that they enjoy? Magazines about their favourite footballer? Um, whatever it is, is worth it. And there's vast research, um, including from the Education Endowment Foundation, showing how uh, important it is and what positive effects um, reading any kind of material has. Um, but most importantly, reading for pleasure has all of these different forms that we can't find anywhere else. So you've got that immersive pleasure, 
the pleasure of being part of a story and really being lost in it. The intellectual pleasure, that pleasure of actually really understanding something at a deeper level. The social pleasure, so being able to um, uh, see something from another person's perspective and really identify with the character, with the author. The work pleasure, um, so the, the pleasure of actually reading something and then using that understanding to do something functional. But also the inner work pleasure, so the pleasure of getting an idea, thinking this is the sort of thing I want to do, this is the sort of person I want to be, and all of these things can be achieved through uh, the enjoyment of reading. Um, and now I know that for some of you, um, your children love reading and, and, and uh, perhaps um, are bored of the school books, but would like to read other books that they enjoy. But I know that for some of you, reading is a struggle and reading has already become a battle and something that um, is considered a chore and children don't want to do. So I just really quickly wanted to go through a very simple strategy that you can use with children. Um, it could also be uh, your, your two children if you have um, siblings of different ages. So a more able reader with the child. Um, and it's only for five to 15 minutes maximum a day. So it shouldn't be more than 15 minutes because we want to keep that enjoyment up. So you start by reading together at the same time, with the same pace. And if the child struggles for three to four seconds, you wait and see if the child gets the word right praise them and continue. Don't give too much attention to that uh, pause. But if the child is still struggling after four seconds or makes a mistake, we don't want to let them struggle. We just give the word. We don't correct. We don't get them to um, decode the word. Just give them the word, get the child to repeat the word and continue reading together. Um, now, if your child is feeling quite confident and wants to read by themselves, um, you can either gradually lower your own voice so that the child is then reading by themselves or have a secret signal that you've agreed in advance. It could be a little knock on the table or, or a squeeze um, that indicates I'm okay and I want to read by myself. But again, if your child is struggling for three to four seconds, you don't you should follow the same process. You don't let them struggle and you give them the correct words. They repeat the words and you continue. So that, that just keeps, uh, keeps the enjoyment up and it's a no fail approach because you're not decoding uh, and sounding out and doing all of that that reminds us of of reading being at uh, work that we don't like at school. Support and engage is the second recommendation that I would make. Um, and really it's about understanding that as parents, you're not expected to be the teacher. Um, thankfully teachers are much better at, at being teachers um, than parents are. Um, and just understanding that the wealth of research that shows that what makes a difference is the engagement bit not the actual skills, not whether you can help children with the math or the science, but the engagement. Um, and that's what has, has a positive effect on, on academic attainment. Now, just sort of try to pull some of the main things that make that engagement uh, a positive experience. So the do's versus the, the don'ts. Um, so uh, important to remember to be engaged with older children as well. We tend to, to not be as involved with older children when they're more able to, to read and to, to progress with their schoolwork. We're just keeping an interest. Um, having high expectations and high aspirations for your child and for their education is really important. But with a focus on self-improvement, of doing better than before, of really trying and, and improving yourself rather than any sort of social comparison. Um, supporting autonomy. So giving that control to the child rather than being quite controlling or interfering or, or um, uh, you know, the, the homework police, uh, uh, because research has shown that that isn't really effective. Um, if anything, it, 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 uh, it interferes with that relationship. Um, asking children for feedback, really asking them to reflect on what aspect of the task was easy, um, what was difficult, what they did when they were stuck. Um, but also praising them for the process rather than praising them for the ability. So rather than saying, oh, well, then you're really good at this, saying, oh, well done for changing your strategy when you saw that wasn't working or really persisting with that, I could see you were struggling. Um, and lastly, letting your child teach you. Um, again, the research shows that um, peer tutoring has benefits for both the tutor and the tutee. So actually giving that control to the child and letting them teach you 
very often I have parents ask me, oh, you know, I can't really support my child with, with a mask because it's not how I was taught it. So just take that position of the student and that will help your child consolidate their own learning as well. And talking about that, that consolidation of the learning, I would say it's quite important to remember that it's more important for a child to really consolidate their understanding and be fluent in what it is that they've learned, rather than trying to progress them perhaps at a rate that is, is faster than they're ready for. So I've just, I just wanted to, to show you this pyramid um, of the development um, hierarchy, uh, because uh, from acquisition to adaptation, which is ultimately uh, the final bit of being able to apply a skill independently in real life in any sort of problem solving situation. And to get there, there are many steps. You have to be fluent. You have to maintain that fluency, generalize the skill. So if you feel like your child isn't really making progress because they're really working on the same level, stick with that level because it might be that they're doing those intermediate steps. Um, which is a very useful uh, thing to be doing at home with them. Now, the third recommendation uh, that I wanted to make is to use project based learning. And when I talk about project based learning, I really want to differentiate it from the typical school projects, which um, might not be as enjoyable. So when we talk about problem based learning, project based learning, excuse me, we're talking about uh, uh, learning that's child led. So really thinking about what does the child want to know? What's a question that your child is being asked? What's a topic that interests them? And just being creative, because anything could be an opportunity to do that deeper learning if you engage in the correct processes of really researching something, um, problem solving something. So that problem solving bit is integral to project based learning. It's about having a, a problem, something I don't know, and thinking about what is it that I know what is it that I don't know and how will I find out? Um, being authentic, making sure that the, the project you're doing has a purpose rather than uh, let's find out more about World War II or whatever that is. Um, having a purpose, is it that you want to communicate something to someone or explain something to someone or is that personally meaningful for your child? But also thinking about the life skills uh, that your child is engaging in in that process the technology, the organization, working towards a deadline, breaking down a task into smaller parts, um, uh, asking questions, evaluating whether a source was good or not, um, but also presentation skills if they're sharing what they've learned. This is really uh, um, hitting the, the theory of zone of proximal development. So any sort of project that you choose that you want to do with your child, Ultimately, what you're doing is you're taking the child from their own zone of what they can do at the moment unaided. And with your support, they're reaching their zone of proximal development. So they're showing us what they can do if they are supported in the right way. And this is what we want to see, uh, because once a child has that support and sees that with specific support, they're able to do the next level, that's the road to them essentially being able to do that independently. Uh, the next time. Um, cooking is a great example for a, a project based learning because uh, you've got it's hitting maths, literacy, uh, independence, confidence, uh, science. So, you know, what's the boiling point and um, what do I have to do? Can I substitute this ingredient with that ingredient? Um, critical evaluation. So, you could really think about why is it, why does it taste? Uh, different than last time we did it, what did we do differently, what do we prefer, why. Cause and consequence, so um, you know you've spilled the milk, you have to pick it up, you have to clean it up, but also that means we don't have any more milk, are we going to substitute it with something? So really taking that responsibility and also working on that language and communication and relationship, um, which is great. So it's a lovely opportunity for a project, I really think cooking is, is great, but also Thinking of um, the research, the evidence does suggest uh, that you can incorporate additional mathematics beyond the recipe. So depending on the age of the child, you can really ask those questions. Uh, so, you know, the recipe is for two people, but we're going to be seven people. Um, how are we going to modify that? Or, you know, we can't, we're not going to eat any sugar. What are we going to modify? How are we going to do that? Um, how many milligrams of the other ingredient, etc. 
but also it can be a lovely special time with your child so that one-to-one -one time um, and it doesn't have to be long but it it uh, it would be great if you have one-to-one -one time with each of the children and um, so perhaps taking turns of doing that cooking together at home some other ideas, I've just tried to collate um, things that I found uh, quite useful, but I think drawing a family tree is a lovely one. Um, really thinking about contacting grandparents, aunts and uncles, um, getting to put in those names, thinking about dates of birth, you know, at what age were they married? So again, you're getting that, that math, uh, those numerical operations in there, at what age, uh, the people in our family do different things compared to the age of the child is um, also really digging into that history um, and that research bit of um, can we research uh, our country of origin or where grandma is from or what's uh, you know what's Italy like or um, what was it like what was London like at that time um, where were they living that, that street that they were living what kind of monument was there so what recipe what were they eating call up grandparents get the recipes um, and really make this a project that's going to be meaningful but also incorporate all of those elements in a fun way um, there's a load of other ideas including some lovely um, uh, engineering challenges by Dyson um, which I put the link there which I think are fantastic to do but even things like um, organizing a community initiative or um, helping a child make a poster uh, for one of the ideas that they, they really um, love or want to support, like the environment or climate change and really doing the research for that. Um, I've put some uh, resources here for you additionally, if you'd just um, like to have a look uh, uh, on various things um, related to the coronavirus as well at the moment. Um, and staying at home with children. And I just wanted to, to, to summarize by leaving you with, with the three recommendations, um, reading for pleasure, support and engage, and um, problem-based learning. Um, and uh, before, before you go, I just wanted to leave you with the thought of, I know that we've been talking about schoolwork um, and this might seem uh, not related, but if there's one thing that I think is very meaningful um, and that would be great uh, for you to do with your children is play. Play with the little ones, but also play with the older children. Um, get your children to show you those TikTok challenges and try to do them. Um, you know, model courage in doing something, doing a dance routine or something that you haven't before. And even if you're embarrassed, take it in your stride. Uh, be silly, make a mess, uh, model what it's like to make mistakes and, and make a mess and then make it right. Um, and, and really have fun with things because at the end of the day, uh, when this is all uh, over and there will come a day when it will be, these are the things that children will remember about the time that they spent at home with you um, rather than the, the, uh, the extent to which um, they, they did the schoolwork because um, schoolwork, is what teachers are going to really be doing when kids are back. They're going to be doing those big assessments and they're going to be targeting those gaps and helping your children catch up. Uh, and we know from the research um, uh, following other um, sort of situations where school had to shut down, that kids can catch up and teachers will do that. So take, take the opportunity to play uh, because this is the sort of thing that um, is going to, to stay with you. Um, so thank you very much uh, for, for listening to this day and I hope that you um, had some, uh, some ideas that you can take with you.